happy to be here today. And I don't see too many aviation folks out there, but I felt it was important for me to start with what we're talking about today, bonfires, beacons, and bureaucracy, with a little bit of aviation background. But first, let me explain the bonfires. Some of you may have seen this particular individual. Does anyone recognize William Hobson, Wild Bill Hobson, early airmail pilot? Okay, well, you'll know more about that a little later. Uh, does anyone recognize this is the beacon part? These were from a series of beacons that were put in by the United States Post Office Department in the 1920s. This particular one is number 41 between Dallas and Kansas City. It had a beacon on the top, and I'll tell you more about that. But you'll notice it also has an arrow. The arrow was so that pilots could... Yes, you're... you're <laughs> and of course, the bureaucracy here of FDR. This is Eugene Vidal, who was the head of the Department of Air Commerce, uh, Secretary of Agriculture, uh, Henry Wallace, in a picture taken in uh, Warm Sulphur Springs. Anyhow, bonfires, beacons, and bureaucracy. Let me lay out a road map for you today. But we're going to do it in reverse order. And the reason we're doing it in reverse order is so that I can begin to... Well, let me show you the first thing. We're well, going to end... I'm showing you the, the, the end first. We're going to end with two questions that I have that relate very, very closely to the Glenn College. Prior to that, we're going to look at some of the early role that the U.S. government played and I picked a couple of pieces right out of the 1926 Air Commerce Act. And you'll notice the quote marks there. The U.S. government encourage and regulate. Encouragement and regulation of aviation, what does that mean? We're going to talk about that. But you'll notice one thing that's missing. It doesn't say support aviation. This is one of the things that will be very, very important for you to understand. And then, of course, we're going to begin with the first thing. The first part of the story began on a beautiful spring day in Washington, D.C., just about 100 years ago today, probably much like this, 70 degrees, sunny skies, and here's what happened. This was going to be the first airmail flight. Fairly straightforward. Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New York City. In those days, that may not seem like much. But this was an astronomical accomplishment at the time because at that point, World War I was just about winding down. We had all these airplanes, we had all these pilots, and nobody quite knew what to do with them. Now, you must remember one thing. The railroads were the kings at the time. All the transportation was railroad. And the idea of an airplane doing anything of any kind of value was pretty much unheard of. Notice that the first airmail between Washington, Philadelphia, and New York was flown by Air Corps pilots. There were no airlines. There was no postal air service. But the idea was Congress authorized $100,000 for airmail pilots, in this case U.S. Air Corps pilots, to fly from Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, and uh, New York. Interesting point here in New York City, they did not land at LaGuardia or Idlewild or Newark Airport. Those did not exist. They landed at the Belmont Racetrack. The aircraft of those days could land and take off in about 1,500 to 2,000 feet. So the infield of Belmont Racetrack was given to the government to use for this crazy thing. One of the things in the background, though, was Congress was worried about this folly. They authorized $100,000 for this folly of using the airplane. Crazy business. Yes? Henry, is the U.S. Air Corps part of the federal government? It's the military. Oh. That was the Army. That is that, it, correct. There was no Navy. It, well, there was Navy aviation. They were uh, float planes at the time. These were the Army guys. These were the Army guys, exactly. Yeah. The head of the uh, detachment was Major Fleet. And one of the pilots... Uh, let me tell you a quick story about it. 
One of the pilots, George Boyle, Lieutenant George Boyle, was uh, set to fly the trip from Washington to Philadelphia. And he took off, and within 15 or 20 minutes, he got lost. He ended up crashing about 25, 30 minutes later, south of Washington. So he actually ended up his first flight 35 miles further back down the road. So it was, the airplanes weren't reliable, compasses were not reliable, there were no maps, things like that. And another thing too, Air Corps pilots were trained to fight, strafe, bomb, but the idea of cross-country navigation was crazy. Hence the idea that Congress thought, this is, this is folly. However, within a year, the expansion westward from New York City to Cleveland, Chicago took place. This was the post office idea. And I happen to have the press release from, eh, let's see, May 15th, um, 1919. Daily aerial mail service to the Chicago-Cleveland leg of the Chicago-New York route was established today on a satisfactory schedule. This was an amazing accomplishment because Congress had just authorized the Transcontinental Airway. It authorized the postmaster to establish airmail service between, first it was New York City and the West Coast. If you go back and look at the original legislation, it said the West Coast. The second version was New York City to San Francisco. And there was also a third version to Los Angeles. They finally settled that the transcontinental would be from, uh, the language was the postmaster general could uh, establish airmail service from New York to San Francisco and all points between. And that was actually, when you start to think about it, just about 100 years ago today. So the regular route was Cleveland, Chicago at first. Uh, why Cleveland, Chicago? Why not New York to uh, Cleveland? Yes? You wouldn't miss the lakes. The Great Lakes. Yes, that you could follow the Great Lakes, and they did. Uh, the hell stretch was between New York and Cleveland in the central part of Pennsylvania. Very, very high. 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 foot mountains. This was a, a very, very difficult stretch. So they ran the first flights from Chicago back and forth uh, to Cleveland that first day. The business was hard. It was tough business. In fact, in the nine years the post office operated the airmail, <laughs> there were 6,500 forced landings. The average lifespan of an airmail pilot was about 900 hours. These were two airmail pilots, one Jack, uh, Jack Knight on the, on the left showing you the front view and another pilot showing the back view. They were well-dressed, they carried guns, but they also wore uh, heavy uh, fur flying collars. It was open cockpits, World War I jennies in a lot of cases. But here was the prize. This was what they were all after. Beginning in New York City, stops for the transcontinental were going to be Belfont, PA. Uh, it's not coming up. For, there we are. Cleveland, Bryan, Ohio, Chicago, Iowa City, Omaha, uh, North Platte, Cheyenne. Uh, I think this is Rawlings and uh, maybe Medicine Bow and Rawlings, uh, Salt Lake City. Elko, Reno, and San Francisco. That was the prize. Now the question here was, how can the airlines be, and I say airlines because that's what it originally, it was originally airmail, but that's what it became. How could they compete with the railroad? And you'll note right there, daylight flying was primarily what people did. There was no night flying. They would carry the mail from New York City or from San Francisco to Cheyenne or to Chicago and then put it on a train for the night, the dangerous night. And the notion there is the mail service has got to figure out some way for this to be 24-7. So what they did, 
as they established the lighted airway. There was need for this all-weather night flying. The railroad still had the advantage because they could go at any time. Even though the average speed of the rail carriers, very, very slow when you figure from, uh, from uh, portal to portal, it was pretty slow, but it was reliable. 1923, the post office installed a series of beacons, acetylene lights, terminal airport searchlights on this Chicago to Cheyenne route. They also had a series of emergency landing fields about every 25 or 50 miles. The, the notion there, of course, was that the planes were not reliable, pilots needed a place to, uh, to land in case of an emergency. And then lo and behold, on April 21st, 2023, the post office inaugurated the first night airway system, airway system in the world. No one else had it. An amazing accomplishment. Here were some of the beacons and the equipment. On the left is a beacon that was uh, preserved and it's in, in the post office museum. Uh, I want to point out one thing that's interesting. You'll notice this light here. Here's the searchlight or the beacon light that rotated. And you'll see it here. This was a course light, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. There was a shack, and this is this is definitely Medicine Bow, uh, Nebraska, or Medicine Bow, Wyoming, right now, and this is what it looked like. And then there's an arrow on the ground, a cement arrow. arrow. I actually took this picture in Newark, Ohio, last summer. If you go to the Newark Airport, you'll see just at the entrance a tower that looks very much like what you see there, and the cement arrow. They've re preserved, they preserved it, and it's just an amazing amazing setup. Anyhow, this course light here flashed a certain Morse code that we'll see about in a minute, and that's an important concept for you to remember. There was a Morse code from 1 to 10. This takes a little explanation. If it was beacon number 1, remember we saw beacon 41 before? If it was number 1, that light that I just showed you would flash dot, dash, dash, dot, dash, dash dot, dash, dash, dot, dash, dash. The pilot would know that that is beacon number one. Now, the only problem is that could also be beacon number 11, or beacon number 21, or beacon number 41. Number two, dot, dot, dash. W, U, V, H, R, K, D, B, G, M. Or, when undertaking very hard routes, keep direction by good methods. Some of you might say, why didn't they use the Morse code for one and the Morse code for two? Well, in some cases, that's five digits. This is confined to four. And somebody made a, a decision somewhere, someplace in the post office department that that's what it would be. So anyhow, if it's beacon number one, 11, 21, it'll have a W, dot, dash, dash dot, dash, dash, dot, dash, dash, over and over again. The federal government, though, is finally going to be involved. Because remember, up to this point, it was the U.S. Post Office Department. They ran from, again, uh, 1918 till 1925. In 1925, the Kelly Act turned over the carriage of mail to private carriers. This was really the birth of the airlines. Compet competitive routes... There were CAM, contract airmail routes, number 1s through 12, and there was the transcontinental route that ran from New York to San Francisco. And the notion was, get out of the flying business, the post office. The government didn't want to pay for the post office, postal service to carry the mail anymore. The routes included, like I say, the transcontinental plus many, many feeder routes. Some of you might be aware that Charles Lindbergh flew on the St. Louis to Chicago airmail route. And there were very, Henry Ford even had a couple of airmail routes from Detroit to Chicago, Detroit to Cleveland, connecting again with points on the transcontinental. 1926, the Air Commerce Act is the first involvement of the federal government. Prior to that, it had been military aviation. It had been, are they going to have a Department of War is going to handle civil aviation? 
there were several proposals during the early 1920s, but finally in 1926, the Air Commerce Act was in effect to encourage and regulate, you saw those words earlier, the use of aircraft in commerce and for other purposes. What are the other purposes? Well, first of all, let's talk about the encouragement. What does that mean, encouragement of aviation? I'm not quite sure. Yes, we're all for it. Well, the regulation seems to be the big point that the government understands very, very well. Within the Department of Commerce, there was an aeronautics branch. It was established, and within uh, several, several years, 1,400 I'm sorry, 14,500 miles of lighted airways were built within the next few years. So the government really began to get things organized, they began to regulate, they began to set up the airways so that they were useful for, again, the airlines that were created under the Kelly Act, 1925. This is also what was needed. The problem with the lighted beacons is you can only see the beacon at night. What about in fog, cloud cover? They needed something else, and we started with the first of the electronic navigation, which is the radio range. This is the low-frequency radio range. There were towers uh, primarily consisting of four poles with wires stretched between them. It was very, very simple. But they radiated the signals N dash dot and A dot dash. And broadcast that signal, and it was set, oriented in such a way that if a pilot was flying from that direction up here, say going in the northwest direction, if you strayed to this side, going towards the station, you would hear dot dash, dot dash in your headphones. If you were on the left, dash dot, but what would happen if you were in the middle? That was what you wanted. That was the beam, flying the beam. So again, the problem was the beacons were not always visible. Radio range was important. And I might mention, the early radio range work is an Ohio project at McCook Army Airfield in Dayton. The Army did an awful lot. So in 1928, the government began to install these radio range stations. And again, the pilots listened to the radio beam and flew the beam, as it was called. One of my favorite slides here, because this begins to show how everything fits together. Getting oriented, 1931, uh, here's Perry, I live, right, I live right here, Perrysburg, Ohio. I'm from Sandusky, that's my hometown. So you can see that, notice these beacons? Those are the lighted beacons from the transcontinental airway. And this is the radio beacon from Cleveland towards Toledo. Notice I've lived under the transcontinental airway most of my life. <laughs> For whatever. So I've been, I've been heavily engaged in this. But there are a couple other things I need to point out to you. The first one is this. You notice here's Vickery. It has beacon 25, dot, dash, dot. It's 25. And here's one, dot, 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 dot. This is located south of Oak Harbor, it's 24. This is 23. But if you'll notice, there's another string of beacons that are going north here. This is seven, this is eight. Well, this shows the scheme of the thing. The beacons were numbered in such a way. This particular one, seven and eight, if you go back and you keep in mind that they were 10 miles apart, 70 miles back this way is Cleveland. This marks the Cleveland to Detroit airway. They were numbered from south to north. This is the Chicago-Cleveland Airway, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. I don't know how you are on distance, but right here you could probably safely say that you're 250 miles from Chicago, and that's, that's accurate. San Francisco to New York, it's about 2,600 miles. And I counted the number of beacons and it's just about the same. And it's also also the distance on I-80. I-80 follows the transcontinental airway and the first airway. So 
these trade routes and things that we've always had have uh, endured. Here's what the network finally looked like in the 1930s. You'll see, again, the transcontinental. You'll see a southern route going in this direction that went through Dallas, the west coast. There's a central one here, St. Louis. Here's the transcontinental. One from New York down through Atlanta. And it's pretty much the travel routes that we, we know today that the airlines cover. But this was the radio range network probably in the 1930s. You might wonder how the Depression was affected by these particular developments. Here's three important dates for you to be aware of. Number one, Herbert Hoover, presidency, March 1929. Actually, Herbert Hoover is one of my heroes. As the Secretary of Commerce, he did a tremendous amount for aviation. Herbert Hoover is one of the unsung heroes in aviation. What do we know about Black Thursday, October 24th, 1929? I'm not sure people know why the Depression really happened or how it happened, but that was kind of the day. And then, of course, Roosevelt was president again in a landslide, March 1933, because, of course, Hoover caused the Depression, all those kinds of things. I don't want this to get into a bipartisan discussion, but again, I'm not sure that Hoover was <laughs> responsible uh, for all these kinds of things. Anyhow, you may think, with the Depression, aviation is going to die. There's going to be no money. Well, I compared from 1929 to 1938. I took some economic indicators from government reports. Federal airway mileage during that time, during that 10-year period, increased 90%. Radio range stations increased 2,289%. Air carrier passengers, 741%. Air freight, 2,838%. Amazing growth in aviation. Why it happened, I don't know. It could be a good doctoral dissertation for somebody, anybody looking for... A, no, no, no takers. Uh, check with your advisors. However, there was a downside. Civil aircraft production notice is down 56%. Nobody was buying, nobody was working. But for some strange reason, we were building engines. Production for American engines, Pratt Whitney, uh, a number of uh, Wright Cyclone engines were very much in demand over the world. And those, for some reason, were... Uh, keeping the production lines going. Airport expansion was quite interesting. 1933, Civil Administration, Civil Works Administration, and the uh, Federal Emergency Relief Administration built 500 airports of various kinds. WPA, many large city airports. Congress authorized $40 million for the development of landing areas for national events, the DeLand Act. In other words, there was great concern during World War II. Coastal artillery was built. Uh, we thought battleships were going to steam off of our coast. We we're going to have to defend uh, our, our coast. So again, building of airports for defense and training, the DeLand Act, $40 million. Thousands of pilots were certified under the Civil Pilot Training Program. Anybody name a pilot that, obviously, John Glenn, and I looked at his logbook downstairs, 1941, New Philadelphia Airport. Uh, I told my wife, Lynn, I said, I've wanted to see this logbook for a long time. And it shows his cross-country flights, when he did it. And again, he trained under the civilian pilot training program. And of course, Don Scott Field was built in the early 1940s as part of this. So we can say that airport expansion during the 1930s, perhaps on the back of trying to keep people working and the government involved, was amazing. A lot of airports were built. Dramatic government expansion. This is the getting into the bureaucratic portion that we're going to talk about. The Civil Aeronautics Act of 1938 combined three particular entities within the government. The first was the Post Office Department, which still, even though they weren't flying, was giving all the, all the contracts for airmail service. The airlines, 
needed the airmail bonus. They carried a lot of passengers, but they needed the subsidy for airmail. The second part was the Interstate Com Commerce Commission would set the rates, and of course, the Department of Commerce would handle the regulation and the licensing. They needed to combine these, and what they did in 1938 with the Civil Aeronautics Act was form the Civic, uh, Civil Aeronautics Authority, the Air Safety Board, and the Office of the Administrator. That didn't quite work. So in 1939, Roosevelt reorganized things, and we came out with the Civil Aeronautics Board. The Civil Aeronautics Board granted, it was five men. I'm sorry, ladies, it was five men at that particular time. I'm sorry, women. It was not women, it was five men. And they would give uh, preferential treatment to certain air carriers who would carry uh, mail to and pick up passengers at certain locations. They also set the rates. They gave the contracts. They had complete control. The administrator for the Civil Aeronautics Administration would then do all the licensing. Now, the question that I have for you deals with policy. That's the place we're going at the end here. There are three particular pieces of legislation that I know about aviation policy. Now, I've looked at the faculty members in the John Glenn College, and each of them customarily will say something about health care policy. They'll say something about housing policy. They'll say something about some type of policy. I'm not quite sure anybody has ever done anything with aviation policy. Except in 1934, the Federal Aviation Commission was formed by Roosevelt because there were the airline scandals and the uh, giving of airmail contracts that were very, very uh, poorly. It's a, it was a scandal. So Roosevelt said, recommendations for a broad policy covering all phases of aviation. After World War II, the Congressional Aviation Policy Board, 1947, the current and future needs of American aviation and will suggest improved organization of the government designed to assist in handling aviation matters efficiently and in the public interest. The Air Coordinating Committee, 1946 to 1960, to provide for the fullest development and coordination of the policies and activities of the federal agencies charged with the statutory responsibility in the field of aviation. Those are the only three things that I found in my literature search that talks about aviation policy. Who sets the policy today? Are there issues that we have in aviation that are critical? Well, here are a few issues that might be considered policy. What about air traffic control and airspace management? Aviation funding, user fees, uh, PFCs are passenger facility charges. Who decides how they should be levied? System capacity and development, airport use and privatization. My question is, does the U.S. have a current aviation policy? I asked a couple of the doctoral students, so what is, before, I said, so what is policy? What does that mean? Uh, all the faculty members seem to talk about policy, but do they, I see a couple smiles someplace, and do they really know what it is? If there is such a policy, what is it? If there is none, should there be one? What part does regulation play in this scheme? This is one of the problems, I th because in 19, uh, when, when Roosevelt uh, decided that we're not going to have the Aviation Coordinating Committee, they abdicated policy to various federal agencies. And I wonder sometimes, is there a fourth branch of the government that's dealing with policy? And I come to you today and I ask these two questions to John Glenn College. I'm glad the dean is here too, that's always <laughs> just at the right time. <laughs>
Could the John Glenn College play a significant role in serving as an academic resource to assist U.S. aviation stakeholders? I labored over the word stakeholders for a long time. I didn't know quite what to call the people because who's involved in this policy? Is it the government? Is it the airlines? Is it the lobby groups? Is it the interest groups? Is it the citizens? I'm not quite sure. So the question there is, could the John Glenn College play a significant role in serving as the academic resource to assist U.S. aviation on and on, defining policy-based underpinnings for pressing aeronautical issues? So here's the point where I sit down and I've asked a question. The professor can always ask a question, right? May not always get the answers. We've covered a little bit about aviation. We've covered a little bit about the government's role. And now, today, I ask, could John Glenn do something here? <laughs>